Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm, uh, I'm Lucas as uh, previously introduced. I've been doing acoustic compression here for uh, almost seven years now, I believe. So it's been something that I've been doing for some time. And uh, well, there's, there's a reason for that. The sort of uh, response that we've seen from patients uh, with this technology has been truly remarkable. And we've been able to address a whole bunch of different conditions that simply don't have very good answers outside of what we do here. So that, as said, that's kept me a, a motivation to keep on working here for, uh, for that period of time and to keep on trying to innovate and figure out what we can all do with this therapy and how we can help people with it. So in the past uh, 20 to 30 years, I just thought I'd just segue from Dr. Stacy's historical perspective by showing we went all the way from this machine here, this uh, thing that can fill a room just, uh, and, and that it only works on kidney stones, to something that's a lot, much more small and elegant, a small innovation that's had uh, pretty dramatic implications for what we can do. Because now we aren't forced to go only in small areas and to focus upon uh, small things, we can be much more dynamic with it and work with areas throughout the entire body and uh, cause pretty profound healing in, uh, wherever we wish to direct it. So uh, I'll go briefly into how exactly this works and what exactly it's doing. Uh, Acoustic compression or extracorporeal shockwave is essentially a small sonic pulse that we create inside the body that happens to be traveling at faster than the speed of sound. This causes a, a very unique thing to happen as soon as it enters into the tissue of the body. We get a sound impulse. You can see from the graph there how there's a sudden increase. What that represents is how much energy is in a sm is, is sound energy is in a small area. And you can see it shoots up and goes back down. So it's a very quick sound pulse that's traveling so quickly that the tissue in the area isn't able to flex out of the way quickly enough as it would just, just say with an ordinary vibration or something like that. So instead of uh, just sort of like moving tissue around, we actually get an effect where cells are moved around within the, their location in the tissue and uh, where there's microtrauma to some of the aspects of the cells that creates a very different sort of effect. The uh, overall effect is basically that uh, the cells aren't harmed by being impacted in this way, but the body isn't used to this sort of thing happening, so it believes there is an injury in that area, so it goes to work trying dramatically to, uh, to repair the tissue. And uh, an advantage of this technology over, say, for example, uh, radial shockwave, which is another sort of modality, is that we can go very deep with it. You can see with the figure on the right here, there's uh, a sort of cone that the, uh, that the sound wave comes out in, and at the apex of the cone, we get a small sonic boom, and that's the area that's, uh, that's affected by the treatment. And we can direct this very deep into the body, so we can do anything, you know, if we use uh, a very conical sort of application head, we can go right at the surface of the body and deal with dermatological conditions. So, for example, to bring more blood flow or vascularization to, uh, to the skin, uh, or we can go very deep and deal with very deep tissues such as the vertebrae or the back. So there's not very many places that we can't go. And the cool thing about it is it's not specific to any uh, single tissue. We can use it on skin, uh, cartilage, ligament, bone, and they all react in very much the same fashion. So we can see here, there's, uh, this is a scan that they did while putting acoustic compression into the body. This is before the sound impulse has happened. You can see the, the uh, tissue has just sort of been pushed up like that by the head of the machine pushing against it. And then as soon as the acoustic compression sonic boom happens, you can see that there's small black dots in there. Those are cavitation bubbles, basically places where the impact has caused the uh, uh, momentary vacuum bubbles to form in the tissue where they snap shut again. And this is what bounces the cells around and causes the effect. You can also see there's sort of ripples that come, go out from that. So there is some impact on the uh, tissue surrounding it, although exactly where the, uh, where the therapy is going is gonna have the, uh, the most impact and have some of the most uh, unique biological uh, functions happen thereafter. So, these are some of the things uh, that we know about what exactly happens after we create these sonic pulses in, in the body. This is the technical version. I'll get around to explaining it in a second. So I'll just read this at you. Reduction in sensation of chronic pain mediated by non-myelinated C nerve fibers. Immediate pain relief by depletion of substance P. Blockade of neurogenic inflammation playing an important role in the pathogenesis of, ins of insertion tendinopathies such as tennis elbow, plantar fasciitis, etc. Improved blood circulation in the treated tissue, release of growth factors. And uh, so that's uh, oh, another one, yeah. Activation of mesenchymal stem cells such as osteoblasts, thereby induction of healing. So this is just uh, to show you that, the, that, that we know something about some fairly technical things that happens. In more layman's terms, uh, that, that means that we get uh, first and foremost, a decrease in pain for a short period of time after doing the therapy. This can last anywhere from just an hour or two 
to several days afterwards. And that's actually quite helpful in certain conditions where there's not very much function in the area. So uh, uh, if a person is not able to move uh, an area very well, it can be difficult to rehabilitate it because natural motion is simply not present to, to uh, create healing. So just by reducing pain for a little while, we can actually have a therapeutic uh, impact. But mostly this is a, or this, we consider this to be a benevolent side effect where the patient feels better for a little while afterwards uh, before uh, the actual healing processes actually kick in. So we stimulate new cell growth. Cells begin to, uh, to divide more quickly in an attempt to heal the area. So we get uh, places that have had, uh, for example, uh, a slight tear in the tissue or something like that. The rate of healing simply increases. And this is helpful for things that, uh, like um, uh, repetitive motion injuries where there's, con say, for example, if you're a carpenter and you're always hammering, you're always doing a little bit of damage to your wrist day by day. And if your natural healing simply is not able to keep up with that, eventually you get a chronic condition. If we can speed up the healing, that sometimes gives the body the ability to get ahead of that and resolve that sort of condition. And it's, of course, helpful for all sorts of other things, too, where, uh, wherever we need some sort of healing process that simply is not happening. Um, creates new blood flow. So this, of course, is helpful for bringing energy to the area, increasing mitochond uh, mitochondrial potential, um, and also uh, creating uh, pretty dramatic effects in areas that have suffered from a, lot, a lack of circulation. So there's actually some really interesting research in uh, using this on issues such as diabetic ulcers, that um, basically uh, with a diabetic ulcer, there's not enough blood flow to the area, and so the skin begins to be unable to heal itself quickly enough, and uh, you get an ulceration, a sore that doesn't heal. So by bringing more blood flow to the area, you can actually get pretty dramatic healing of, of uh, injuries specific to that. You also run into things like um, varicose veins where, uh, where we can help to relieve that sort of condition simply by, by giving more outlets from the blood vessel, uh, and, that, uh, and that can take some of the pressure off of these, uh, these vessels that are under stress. And there's even some interesting research. This isn't something that uh, is very, it's not really done clinically yet, but there's some interesting research in even dealing with cardia, uh, uh, cardiac conditions, conditions of the heart, uh, by uh, helping to increase blood flow to the heart after it's been injured by a heart attack or other event, or by helping to uh, release uh, blockages by creating new routes for the blood to travel into the heart. So that's, uh, that's something that's very exciting. It's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how uh, that sort of therapy changes in the next uh, few years here. It regulates and decreases inflammation. This is by bringing specific cells to the area that are designed to investigate areas that are injured. And so the body kind of evaluates like, okay, is there, uh, uh, what's going on here? Do we need to send in the troops as it were and create so, uh, more healing than is happening? And in that case, actually increase inflammation. In, for example, an injury that simply didn't heal correctly the first time, or that uh, could, could uh, benefit from more healing. Uh, or in, place, in places where there's, say, arthritis, where there's too much inflammation that's breaking things down, it'll attempt to recognize that and bring the inflammation down, allowing the circumstance to resolve itself. So this is, this is an important thing. I know we talk a lot about things being anti-inflammatory, but sometimes you need a brief inflammatory response in an area to get healing going. But very commonly, we're doing this to reduce places that have an inappropriate level of inflammation. Uh, breaks up scar tissue, simply because the st scar tissue is rigid, when that shock wave travels through, it tends to break up uh, cells that uh, contain scar tissue, and, or comprise scar tissue rather, and that uh, reduces the amount of scar tissue in the area. So we'll use this in areas where there's uh, scarring preventing motion in an area, or where there's some sort of, uh, say, pulling on the skin uh, because of some, for example, like a surgical scar. That, uh, that's, say, having adhesions with things beneath it, we can reduce the amount of scar tissue in the area. Usually, uh, uh, you can still see the superficial scar, but the actual, like, puckering or adhesions will tend to go away. And uh, bring stem cells to the area. And this is actually one of the most exciting things about the, about the therapy, and it's one of the things that makes it an actually regenerative therapy. So, like, um, uh, we've tried to do all sorts of different things with uh, stem cells. You know, we just will culture stem cells in a petri dish, inject them in an area to try to heal it, and the body simply doesn't really know what to do with it because it wasn't expecting that, and they go away, and there's a minim there tends to be a minimal effect with that sort of thing. So what we're finding is um, if we can actually endogenously create a need for stem cells by basically telling the body, hey, here's an injured area, go to fix it, the body will begin to utilize its own stem cells, send them to that area, and begin to repair it. So this, this actually is one of the first practical uses for stem cell therapies that we have. And it allows us to reverse conditions that otherwise we could only control, such as, for example, um, reduction of space between vertebrae or destruction of joints by arthritis. We can actually begin to grow those things back again. And I've seen 
clinically in x-rays, I've seen uh, disc spaces increase by, uh, small, uh, t by small amounts and people whose arthritis was so bad that their hands were twisted over returned somewhat to normal in addition to the, uh, uh, to the decrease in pain and the stop of progression that we get with that. So that's always been a, 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 very, a very awesome thing to see. So a little bit more data here. This sort of is comparing a conventional therapy, uh, basically a steroid injection uh, uh, into, the, into the shoulder when there's a, uh, when there's a frozen shoulder uh, with using uh, extracorporeal shockwave therapy or acoustic compression. Uh, again, those are, those are different terms for the same thing. So what we get is, you see when we uh, first put in the steroids, there's actually a very dramatic response. Uh, you can see in some, in some of these bars here, and th th this is just sort of like uh, uh, external versus internal rotation, so it's just two different measures of motion. And you can see that, uh, you know, around uh, week four and six, uh, or thereabouts, uh, we're getting pretty similar looking results. But as you keep on going on, what happens is that the steroid uh, begins to wear off around week 12, uh, and uh, the purple bar here at the, at the end is actually quite a bit more pronounced with the extracorporeal shockwave, meaning that more people kept on getting better. So, for example, track, um, I know there's a lot of data here and some of you not, might not be able to see that, but track how the extracorporeal shockwave, the purple bar, that's the best uh, re result, keeps on improving with each uh, week all the way up to the third month here. Uh, whereas uh, you just sort of get a stalling with the steroid, which means that no further healing has, has happened. So uh, another cool thing about this is that once you've created this response, it keeps on going for a very long time. So oftentimes after we work on an area for just a short period, if it's a more chronic condition and isn't completely fixed within a few weeks, it just keeps getting better and better. So what do we all use this on? Well. <laughs> I'm always a little bit hesitant to really go into all the different things we can use this on because it sounds like, it almost sounds too good to be true. It sounds like I'm, I'm peddling a panacea here. So let me say there are things that, we, uh, that this is not appropriate to use on. We can't use it on like diabetes or some of these more systemic conditions like this. And there are, there are some specific circumstances that we can't use it for, but a lot of different things that just involve some old injury, some, uh, uh, some issue with the orthopedic uh, condition of the body. There's, very few things that we cannot use it on successfully. So you can see quite a few different uh, yeah, orthopedic type conditions here. Yeah, uh, problems with the neck, uh, problems with the shoulder, with the elbow, the hand, mid-back, low back, foot, hip, and knee. So all of these areas are ju uh, just, you know, we get, the, we get a joint, we get a ligament, we get a muscle, any of these things. It works the same on a hip as, uh, as in a foot, uh, as on the neck, or anywhere else. So we can use it on all these sorts of different areas, whether there's pain, degeneration, arthritis, or anything like that. We can use it on inflammatory conditions. This is uh, a picture of uh, arthritic hands. I've mentioned a little bit of that already. I've run into people that we've managed to uh, reverse the arthritis such that there's a, a complete absence of symptoms to maybe something like an 80% reduction of, of uh, symptoms. And we've been doing this long enough to know that that proceeds persistent in the long term. I tend to start seeing people back after uh, two to four years, uh, they, start, they start saying, yeah, yeah, this is starting to wear at me a little bit again, and we, uh, and we just work at it a, a few more times and get it back on track again. So it doesn't, uh, in this case, since it's a progressive condition, it does eventually return, but it takes a long time for it to, uh, for it to uh, even begin to come back. Uh, we talked a little bit about the interesting ideas that we have surrounding the heart. And again, this isn't something that we quite do yet, but uh, uh, there's some pretty interesting uh, things that we're learning about how we might be able to use it on internal organs such as the heart. And in fact, we've already begun to use it on s uh, some other internal organs such as the uh, intestines. So the intestines tend to be something where people will fight for a long time to get them under control once they have, say, irritable bowel syndrome or something like that. And uh, what we've noticed with this is something that we might expect to take, say, that the, the gut is just uh, very leaky, the person has uh, very, uh, a lot of aggravation in the gut, they come in uh, before we got this machine and we're like, yeah, we can, we can help with that. And uh, so we change their diet, we give them supplements, and uh, say, uh, 9 to 12 months on, they would, uh, their problem would be resolved. Uh, what we find is we do exactly the same things as we did before, but we also add acoustic compression to the mix, and this accelerates the healing to the degree that they might be better in something more like two to four months. So something like a third of what we, what we saw before, which of course makes things a lot easier for the patient. So um, we can of course deal with vertebral problems, and that's something that's, uh, you know, we do quite a bit of chiropractic work here, of course. Uh, so it's been pretty interesting to see how working with uh, chiropractic, which uh, regulates the structure of the back and then also getting a little bit more focused tissue healing in the back, how the combination of those things is able to 
uh, get people better faster than we could have uh, done before with either of those two things alone. Uh, and indeed, uh, even work with some things that would have been that we would have uh, struggled to completely resolve before. And uh, this is something we do a little bit less as well, but there's even some dermatological uh, things where people are, are using it cosmetically to reduce the impression of wrinkles and cellulite and things like that. And uh, this is just because of the way that it uh, brings a bit more blood flow to the area and can break up adhesions in the skin and, and things like that. It's, uh, not gonna, it's not gonna completely eliminate things. This maybe wasn't the best selected picture because it's kind of depicting like that, but it does seem to actually make a, a noticeable difference to things like that. So that's a pretty broad spectrum of different things that we can, that we can address with this. It's, um, and that leads to uh, quite, quite a few very interesting stories, the things that you know, keep me coming back here and keep me working at this machine day after day. So uh, I saw uh, a man who had come in who had had terrible uh, problems with his knees and with his shoulders for, I believe it was something like 12 years. And uh, it, it had all happened after a pretty bad car accident that uh, unfortunately uh, some of his family had passed away and, and, and so on. And he, and he, was, he could walk with difficulty. Um, but uh, we did uh, acoustic compression on him. He was, it was very sore to work on at first, but after just a few sessions, he was able to walk much further than he could before. He went uh, on vacation up north and was able to hike the dunes and uh, had some pain doing that, but um, it was something totally beyond what he could do before. And he said that he, uh, when he got there, he realized that he was able to bend his knee enough so that he could ride a bicycle again. He wasn't able to get the pedal all the way around before. So in spite of any sort of pain level, he, he wasn't able to, uh, to bicycle. And so he got on his bike and he started biking around the car that his wife was in just until she noticed that here he was uh, grinning ear to ear, going around in circles on the bike again. It was, it's just a fantastic story to hear. Or uh, the story that uh, Dr. Denver was telling earlier, I saw, I saw this patient again today who had, uh, I believe he told his wife that it felt like there was a truck on his back and after just uh, three, uh, three uh, treatments on the back, suddenly uh, the pain was virtually gone and he had difficulty lifting things uh, still. That, that kind of set it off again, but uh, I think that he's very well, uh, very much on the right road. Or I get to hear about people who, are, who begin to garden again, people who begin to uh, be able to do things that, they, that uh, they haven't been able to do for a long time. And I also see quite a few athletes in here and it's kind of fun to be able to get them uh, back on track again in time, for the, in time for the big game, you know? It's like, if we can cut the healing time by a week or two with a sprained ankle, that's uh, two more games that they, that they can play in. So this is something that encompasses quite a few different things and a lot of what is preventing this from being a phenomenon is simply the fact that, you know, there's not very much information out about it. So part of what we're trying to do here is get it so that more people are aware of what this is and what it can do. And, um, one of the cool things about it, I just, uh, you know, some concluding thoughts about that, is that uh, the, the overall thing is that this serves as an excellent middle ground where uh, between, you know, the sort of condition where it's like, oh, my shoulder aches a bit, maybe do a few stretches and it goes away, versus, oh, this, you know, the, the, you have a uh, ligament that's in two pieces and we need to go in surgically and put it together. This offers a middle ground where we're creating a profound healing uh, response from the body's own ability to do these things. Uh, and it's, um, very safe. Uh, as we said, you know, it's not entirely painless, uh, uh, but we're not cutting the body open. You don't go away feeling pain. It's just a little bit sore as we work on it. So there's, it's minimally invasive, only takes a few minutes to do. Uh, it's not going to cost thousands of dollars like a surgery would. And, uh, the, uh, and the results that we see from it are quite spectacular. It's uh, just a great combination of different attributes that's, that this strange little sound wave therapy has allowed us to do. It's um, been in use on, on, in the human body in the form of lithotripsy for 30 to 40 years now, and uh, there's never really been a single reported adverse side effect, except, uh, again, Dr. Stacy mentioned uh, with the, with the uh, gigantic blast that these soldiers were suffering from, there was some damage to the lungs. There doesn't seem to be any risk of, it, uh, of, of that sort of thing at the intensities that we're using, but uh, it's still something that they avoid at, at the level of lithotripsy, but it's not. Uh, but yeah, so far as we can tell, in uh, the thousands of journal articles that have been published about this technology, we haven't really seen any single side effect from it. And, uh, th and that, I think that that's just a fantastic thing to see. So I hope that we keep, can keep on growing this thing here, not uh, you know, for my sake or anything like that, but for just for the sake of all the people that can benefit from it that currently are not. There's a lot of people in pain out there. Pain is one of the most common conditions that people go to their doctor to see about. Pain and lack of mobility. And uh, if, we could if we can reduce the amount of pain that people are suffering by the, by the degree that I'm seeing day by day, that would be a fantastic thing to, to uh, aspire to. So that's what we're trying to do here. So two years ago, broke my collarbone in several places. It was about this far apart. My doctors were not happy with me. 
And um, excuse me. Maybe you should tell the story as to how you got that. No, that's okay. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I. Uh, my wife said, maybe you should get an opinion by one of your friends uh, who happened to be an orthopedic uh, man. And so I went to visit him and he says, well, this is going to mean 12 to 16, 16 weeks off. We have to pin it. And I said, no, we cannot do that. So we employed the acoustic compression machine. It um, was rather painful at first because my collarbone was this far apart. And I was eagerly taking the x-rays to doctors for every week, right? And wouldn't you know it, by the first week, I felt this tugging, just this, 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 this pulling. And I looked on the x-ray and I saw these little lines connecting the bottom to the top of the brake. And I started pulling it together, just oh pulling it together. And every week, it was more and more together. And wouldn't you know it, I was full on doing rehabilitative exercises with my uh, patients, adjusting my patients by week four. Uh, to this day, there is no callus. There, you can't tell where it was broken and it was in pieces. Um, so it, it, it truly is amazing how it can prevent scar formation, how it speeds up healing. And um, I uh, did go back to the doctor and he said he'd never ever seen anything like it. So I was pleased to uh, impress him. <laughs> so there's a, that's just a little personal uh, that's the story art, on that. The art of breaking expectations, that's what we do here, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Good. You can probably just put that one down. <coughs> yeah, we can use your ankle. We've done a little bit of work already on that. So, uh, I uh, actually sprained my own ankle once uh, a few years ago while doing trail running. Here, I'll, I'll have you put your foot up on here. And, uh, you know, uh, an uh, upshot of this job is uh, I was able to get the acoustic compression on it within an hour and uh, hurt like the dickens for that day and, uh, and the next uh, to some degree and then it was completely gone. And this is a sort of sprain that probably would have taken two to three weeks to heal under ordinary circumstances. So if we can get right on an injury like that, it's quite remarkable what we can do with it. Sometimes I do see the, the injuries that heal the very fastest are a little bit painful just as we, uh, just for a day or two after we work on them though. So, this is uh, just to sort of demystify what exactly we do here. This is obviously the acoustic compression machine. Um, has a bunch of different controls here and uh, the apl applicator head here. There's a kind of half circle of piezoelectric crystals uh, in the head of the machine here. And what that means is it's basically a substance that expands when you give it an electrical charge. And so by putting a very specific electrical charge in that, it causes a very quick expansion. And that's what is able to create the sound wave, which is traveling at you know, faster than, uh, at faster speeds than would be ordinarily allowable. And uh, so I'm able to go in at various depths. I'm gonna go in for to a, about 15 millimeters here just by changing how conical the head of the machine is here. And much like with an ultrasound machine, just as a conducting medium, we put a gel on the area, just like so. Without that, the air would uh, make it not very efficiently go into the body. And it's simply a matter of uh, working around the area for um, four to seven minutes depending on how large it is and so on and finding out where exactly the area is. One of the cool things about it is that since there's a little bit of sensation in areas that have inflammation, um, we're able to use this diagnostically at the same time as we use it therapeutically. So by asking Dr. Stacy to let me know when she can feel it, I'm able to figure out which areas are still affected. You can feel that right there? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any radiation to the toes there? Yeah, if I, uh, I wasn't uh, precisely expecting that there, but if we found that here, then I'd know that the tarsal tunnel is involved, simply because we were activating the, the nerve that goes down to the toes. So there's cool things like that. It kind of lets you see how exactly the whole body is uh, hit, hooked together there. So I'm not going to do the whole thing here, of course. That would take a little bit of time, but you get the, you get the impression of this here. Oh, pretty good right there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we get to the peripheral <laughs> joints. <laughs> yeah, people think... Be strong, be strong. <laughs> People think that I can read minds, but really I'm just reading their face. Yeah. <laughs> Never let it see sweat. Mm -hmm. So this was sprained in August, beginning of August, and it's still thicker mm -hmm. than the other ankle, but I've only done like, two acoustics on it. Yeah, we've been a little bit less than consistent about that one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been as good most of the time. It's, oh yeah, Lucas doesn't have time. Blake doesn't have time. I'll get in next week. Yeah. <laughs> Next week never comes. Yeah, I mean, at least we're busy, right? Yep. To be fair, it was a pretty bad spring. Well, yeah, it, it blew up kind of like what, what Doc was saying, you know, it blew up very quickly. Yep. And I was um, 
it, of course, it happened on a Friday night, and I was gone out of town for the entire weekend, so it was Monday before we actually were to get the acoustic on it. I do carry my own laser because I do work on horses, mm -hmm. so I did laser it a little bit, but that didn't, it definitely didn't do very much. Yeah. Well, it was, it was I, I don't know if it's the worst sprain I've ever seen, but it was very bad. I think we'll leave it at that for now, but we'll have to get you a little bit more uh, comprehensively again in the future here. Doc and so. I are working on having the same ankle. <laughs> Pretty much. One bad sprain versus ten minor sprains, right? The wind signal is a No, no, it is, it's not. It's quite tolerable, and we can turn down the intensity if it's too much. <laughs> so, yeah, they can always yeah. turn it up or down, which is, which is a great thing. Um, and you don't have to tolerate the pain. Like, you don't have to sit there and go, oh my gosh, just keep going, it hurts really bad. Mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily what we're hoping for, is for you to just sit there and cry in pain. No um, yep. Right. There, there always is a little bit of pain with it, and, and the worse it gets, um, obviously there's, there's going to be some pain for the healing. Um, but the areas that you don't find pain, there's still healing happening, because any time you send the sound waves into the body, you are increasing blood flow to that area. So if there's any damage to that area, you are healing it. So to us, that's, that's a great piece, because sometimes you catch things that you never knew were going on in the first place. Yep, we'll, so. we'll get the occasional person that uh, kind of get instructions from the doctor like, hey, help me try to figure out what's going on here. I can't, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. And so then I'll check out a bunch of things that might be related to it and we can kind of figure things out that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty cool that way. Yeah, awesome. So that's, that's what it looks like. It's, uh, as you can see, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not nothing, but it's not that difficult to do. And in most areas are actually quite a bit less sensitive than the ankle, so. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's what we do here, so. It is just skin on skin. That's the hard thing for most people to understand is that mm -hmm. it does have to be skin on skin. So yes, if it is your gluteal area, you are showing your bum. Yeah, well. <laughs> could be worse things. Realities of clinical, uh, clinical right? profession, you know, so. It's, it's mostly everybody else is nervous, not, not your technicians, so. Mm -hmm. But with that, um, we'll open up for questions. But next month, um, here are some of our references. Next month, Doc, um, is it genetics? No, toxicology. Toxicology. In toxic environment, and uh, it, it should be, uh, I, I don't know where to stop on that one. It's, it's, it's just unbelievable, the amount of toxins, and what, which, which ones do I choose to talk about? Yeah. So, At some point, you're just scaring people. Yeah, well, there, there's one, I'm going to use one slide that's going to scare everybody, and it's all these toxic toxins that we're currently exposed to, and all its negative effects, and it's all in fine print, so right. I think I'll, I'll use that one just as a scare tactic for a slide, maybe, mm -hmm. but then we'll go into the major ones. I, um, you know, to even just when you think about it, uh, you know, the whole thing uh, up in Rockford with the uh, dump from the, sh the shoes, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Um, from yeah, Wolverine, well, exactly. And I, 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 was, I was thinking about that the other day as I was walking around in my leather shoes, bare feet. And <laughs> exactly, he's getting that. So here I have barefoot, wet contact against that very same hide that they are now considering toxic, where it's leaching down about 100 to 300 feet into the well water, and here I am exposing my feet directly onto that. What's that doing? I didn't see that in the newspaper, <laughs> right? So the amount of toxins that we're exposed to that, that, that we don't even think about, I mean, I didn't think about that, uh, is just absolutely shocking. So we're gonna get into that fun topic. Sorry, that went into a little rant there. <laughs> 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 That's okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we got a question. You mentioned that increase in circulation and mm -hmm. improves nitric oxide. Is what? that a short-term benefit? Is that something that lasts for a little while? It lasts. Yeah, the, uh, the, the increase in circulation in particular does because it induces something called angiogenesis, which is the produ production of new blood vessels. And uh, so, so this is actually one of the more dramatic effects that we get from it. And, th and those blood vessels are permanent. So if we need more circulation to an area, mm -hmm. we can get that there. But the nitric oxide, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it will, it will permanently or long term? Mm -hmm. Not that'll, permanent. That'll, that'll I don't think anything's ever bit. ever permanent, but mm -hmm. as you continue, like with what we do in conjunction to acoustic compression with working with healing the body with nutrition deficits of building those back to being nutrition stores and, and getting the body healthier, then you are prolonging the benefits of the acoustic compression. But if you do pr uh, create the angiogenesis, mm -hmm. you improve the nitric oxide, I mean, that improves things like blood pressure and vessel health and mm -hmm. yes. yada, yada, yada. Can, can I jump in on this one for a second? Sure. So, so I, this makes me remember a patient uh, that uh, had some 
incredible blockages and was unable to walk further than say about a city block and absolutely refused bypass. Did not want to do it. And we're talking complete blockages of the left anterior descending and just all very critical areas. And um, we engaged with acoustic compression on that one. Do you remember this one or not? Yeah, I do actually. Yeah. yeah. So we did the acoustic compression towards the heart and wouldn't you know it, open things up. We had mm -hmm. an uh, angiogram that was done, I believe, in the eight or nine months later, and it showed renewed circulation to the heart, and this man is fully functional. Would it improve things like aortic stenosis? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Yeah, they're actually starting to do research on um, patients that uh, go in for stenosis or even cardio blocks, and they're doing it with the patient open. And yeah. they're doing it over that to help to improve the healing time so that it prevents it long term from happening. So right. those are the newest research that's actually yeah, you gave in. gave me a paper the other day. That's actually the first time I've heard of that. Mm -hmm. Although I, I was speaking with a psychiatrist once, I don't want to get off on a rant, and he was wondering if we could use this to break up Alzheimer plaques. And I'm like, well, you know, we'd have difficulty getting through the cranium. And he's like, well, why don't we just drill a hole in the skull and put it in that way? <laughs> so he was a creative fellow that way. <laughs> Everybody wants a hole in their head. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, they actually are doing that where they cut open, put a probe in there and hit the heart because it's difficult to hit through the rib cage. But, yeah. mm -hmm. but the aorta you can definitely get just by going at it that. Yeah. So, yeah. Because the aorta sits right in front of the lumbar vertebra. So you can get to that easily. Mm -hmm. What about inconvenient cysts? I had an inconvenient cyst that was right in the set. Mm -hmm. This is before I saw you. And it, it disappeared by some magical way. But I wonder about for this particular... Yeah, we, we have done some uh, clinical work with cysts. There's a little bit less research about it, but uh, s uh, simply because uh, uh, in the course of things, we'll, uh, we'll work with these things sometimes. And my experience with them is that they're uh, hit or miss. They either take care of it like magic or they do nothing to it. So um, uh, we have a pretty high efficiency rate with it, but uh, so it is oftentimes worth a shot. So that's, that's usually what I see with that sort of thing. So Even warts. Yeah, it's a, yep. same thing with those actually. Yeah, it's like 60% uh, of the time they go away after a week or two like it never was and then like 30% of the time it just does nothing to it and it's kind of hard to say why but that's really, that's kind of what I've seen with it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What about things like <clears throat> regenerating cartilage in the joint? Like, I'm just curious how many times you'd have to do it, how frequently or how long to see any kind of results like yeah. these. Well, it depends on uh, the severity of the circumstance, of course, but when we're trying to regenerate cartilage in the joints, uh, well, often uh, the thing that I most commonly see when there's, say, been arthritis and degeneration for a long period of time is that we'll get a mild improvement after, after just a few weeks, and then uh, we'll discontinue treatment after, say, a month or two, and at the three-month mark, suddenly things come around. Uh, for some reason, it seems that most regenerative things take about that long to start kicking in. So uh, to answer your question as to uh, how many we need to do, I'll, I'll oftentimes start with six to eight, wait until we hit that three month mark to see how far that took us, and then if necessary, do more, but oftentimes that's sufficient. Okay, so you say six to eight weeks, how many times per week? Uh, we'll start out uh, with that sort of thing, I like to just do it weekly. Uh, you know, with a more uh, recent injury, we like to, we like to you know, hit, uh, get, uh, get the ball rolling more quickly by doing it more frequently. With that, it's such a slow process, just like, okay, let's get it going slow and steady and, and wait to see how it settles out at the three month mark. Okay, and does the prognosis have to do with how severe the loss is when mm -hmm. you start out? Or? Yeah, the, the, the prognosis, yeah, I mean, everybody's uh, gonna heal differently, of course, but uh, the, things that, the things that most impact that is like how healthy is a patient and um, how far along is the degeneration? Because it's, um, just hypothetically, it, uh, uh, I, I've seen some strange things where people were supposedly bone on bone and it still came back. But uh, hypothetically, if there's absolutely no cartilage left, then it shouldn't be possible to grow it back. Um, but uh, um, if there's anything left, then we should be able to get it back. Although if it's very minimal, then of course it's probably gonna take more effort than a person who just has mild degeneration in the area. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> those are the two things that impact it really. Okay, but in general, six to eight weeks, you shouldn't see something or at least have yeah, maybe a little, yeah, like I see something like a 20 to 30% reduction in pain. Uh, still oftentimes is, you know, sore to walk on and things like that. Basically what that is, uh, I believe, is um, the uh, reduction of inflammation that we get within a few weeks due to the immune uh, system coming to the area and recognizing that there doesn't need to be that much inflammation there. And uh, so then that, that, that helps things out a little bit, you know, it calms things down a little bit. But you don't really get the results until you start getting that regrowth of cartilage. So, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So can we go to the other side of the equation? So let's say you get a patient who is resistant to change, does not respond. Mm -hmm. Can this machine make it worse? No, there's never been a single recorded instance of this permanently making any condition worse that I've seen, and, that, and there's thousands of papers. So that's, uh, uh, that is always something to emphasize. It's like, okay, well, every once in a while uh, you run into somebody that it doesn't work for, but I've never seen anybody get permanently worse from it. And that's a, and that's a pretty remarkable thing because most, ther uh, most every therapy has some risk mm -hmm. out there. And pretty much the only risk with this is, well, occasionally I see a person that hurts a little bit more for a day or two afterwards, and that's actually usually a good sign because those people tend to get better faster. So, yeah? Would this help someone with peripheral neuropathy? Can you talk about some ah, yeah, I, I, I actually didn't address that. Um, yeah, we actually do deal with uh, neuropathy. It works on nerve tissue as it would with anything else. Uh, so, uh, I mean, in these cases, it is important to figure out what's causing the neuropathy. Cancer treatment. Yeah, so uh, if there's some sort of uh, specific area that is uh, affected, then we can oftentimes work with that area and, uh, and see some sort of benefit with, with that. Just by, you know, we get more blood flow to the so nerves. So the person's toes are tingling? Mm -hmm. would be the area you would yep, yep, yep. We'd have, to, we'd have to figure out, okay, is it, you know, in the tarsal tunnel? Is it in the sciatic nerve? Is it... The first point with Dr. Stacy, you, you start doing it, oh, that's the spot right yeah, there. Yep. And that's the spot right there. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's difficult to figure out what exactly or, the origin of neuropathy is. I know they can do fancy tests. They tend to be expensive. With this, we can kind of just be like, hey, let's check these sort of crucial points and see if there's some area that, you know, kind of lights up the foot or something like that. So there's, there's a few different things depending on what exactly is going on with the neuropathy. But. Now, do you do that conjunction with supplements? And yeah, for sure. Like, yeah. like, like alpha lipoic acid is supposed to help mm -hmm. people with peripheral neuropathy. So yeah. if you did that and this, it would seem like that you could get some really significant Yep, mm -hmm. uh, synchristic, uh, synchristic uh, capability for sure. Yeah, we, uh, we try to work with as ma uh, from as many perspectives as we can that way. Because uh, when all of the different systems of the body are working together, that's going to be, uh, you're going to have much more high likelihood wow. of success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, now I'm, I'm not an expert in supplements, so oftentimes you'll have to be seeing one of the doctors if you want uh, recommendations. There's a few things that I might uh, tell you about, but that's, uh, that's about it. If you want the really detailed things, I advise seeing one of the, one of the doctors here. So. Mm -hmm. And nerve tissue is one of the hardest to regenerate because nerves regenerate the slowest. Mm -hmm. So yep. this nerves actually even, increases uh, that ability. Bones grow sl back slowly, nerves ba grow back even more slowly, so. But the key is they grow back. They, they do. do. Yeah. You just see that even in our Alzheimer's cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the neuroplasticity. It's, it's quite remarkable the way that we can re reverse that. So you see, you use this for Alzheimer's dementia patients? Uh, we, we don't use this for that, no. We, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I had a psychiatrist ask me about that, and I'm like, well, the problem is we just can't get through the cranium. It doesn't, it doesn't pass through thick bone very well. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's, there's things that we would do with supplementation primarily for that. So, yeah. yes? Can you use it for treating gout? Yes. Yeah, gout is another, is another that's a, uh, kind of an interesting one. We've had pretty good success with it. It tends to be a little bit, uh, one of the more unpleasant things to work with because it's pretty painful to start with and so kind of probing in this area isn't too pleasant. Um, and it also tends to, uh, you tend to get quite a bit of pain for a day or two after working on it, but then it goes away. It tends to be one of those cases. So yeah, just uh, the additional metabolism of the cells in the area seems to disperse that pretty effectively. So yeah. Do you have patients, you've been doing this for seven years, that come in every six months and, and hit, go back and hit an area and maybe uh, improve the improvement or yeah. uh, get rid of what was the, the loss of improvement and then mm -hmm. step it back up? Yeah, uh, it's, it's coming to the point where I'm starting to, you know, like uh, at first uh, when we were just doing this for a year or two, it was difficult to see patterns. But we do have some people, like uh, I mentioned uh, earlier, that we have people with arthritis, you know, will work on it and then two, three year, years later I'll see them come back and, uh, you know, get a tune-up kind of. Um, so uh, uh, we do run into that. There are some people also that have conditions that we cannot permanently <clears throat> resolve. For example, scoliosis. So uh, we can't fix the curvature of the spine and that's always going to you know, t tend to cause issues in the area. So, but what they find is if they come in once every two months or something like that, then their symptoms are reduced by say 30% or something like that and that's a worthwhile thing for them. So we do see people who uh, are under maintenance for things like that that we can help with but not get rid of. So. Awesome. All right. Well, it looks like we're kind of winding down here. So. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks so much for coming. Yeah. I know it's something uh,